So this device that we're working on is what I refer to as a bionic pancreas. This device is worn externally and, blood, and, and insulin is infused under the skin. And it is a bionic pancreas because it does emulate physiologic function through um, either electromechanical devices or electronic means or both. There's this, this push-pull mechanism that the pancreas uses. And our device is a bionic pancreas which emulates both the push and the pull. It, develop, it uses both insulin and glucagon. Ed and Faraz's approach to using glucagon is even a little different than the other groups that have incorporated it. Our, our goal is not to treat hypoglycemia once it's occurred, but to use uh, insulin and glucagon as, a, as sort of a subtle push and pull to prevent the need for any rescue uh, with, with glucagon. Uh, my PhD student at the time was Firas Al-Khatib, and um, he was very interested in this idea of using control theory to develop a technology that could automatically regulate glucose. And so that really became this, the substance of his PhD thesis. And um, he developed the, the first generation of the algorithm, and uh, all the core ideas came from his thesis. Uh, we've made you know, lots of changes and improvements to the technology since that time, but that was really the, that's where we got started. Our algorithm would run on a laptop computer initially, and it would speak down to that pump, which the pigs would wear in a shoulder, in a shoulder harness. And we began doing these experiments actually once we moved to Boston University. Ed, in 2006, came to the Joslin to give a talk on his work. And he was describing his work in the pigs at that point. And I was very taken with the, the idea of using glucagon as a counter-regulatory hormone. After that seminar, I went up and talked to Ed. And I was very excited about it. And I said, look, you know, this seems like something that we should really be moving to human trials. Are you interested in talking further? And I said, I have no interest but to do this in human. I'm not interested in doing this in pigs inherently. And uh, we'd like to move to humans. And um, so he said, I'd like to help with that. And that was the beginning of our collaboration. This was really a, a, a fundamentally new technology. So uh, as far as medical devices are concerned, there's really, there's no, there's no analog to this technology. This is something that's you know, automatically pushing insulin. Insulin, as I mentioned, can be very dangerous if overdosed. So this has got a, a big regulatory burden attached to it, and it really has to be done right. If this device you know, isn't well designed, it could cause, you know, wreak havoc. So we actually did something on the order of 40 or 50 subjects, in, probably in our first trial. And we've done at least that many in our second trial, if not more. It needs to be done well, and even the clinical trials need to be carefully monitored and carefully conducted. The equipment has to get to know me, which at this point it now has. So the sensor and the blood glucose are following exactly together. This system, it's constantly watching you every five minutes, and it owns the decisions. And it's much more objective, and um, it's much more patient. And it's also watching the lows, and that to me is the, the key thing here. This thing is turning insulin off, and it's also got this capability of rebounding blood sugar and going and accessing glucose stored in the liver, should you need that, in addition to turning the insulin off. At the same time we're completing the current trial, we're preparing for our next phase trial, and that will be using a fully mobile, fully wearable device. The, the uh, device itself is about the size of one of the older cell phones. And that's what we've come to. So essentially what we have is a system wherein the transmitter wirelessly talks to the receiver on the back of this device, which is hardwired into the phone which runs our algorithm. The algorithm makes therapeutic decisions to dose insulin and glucagon every five minutes. This phone then talks by way of low power Bluetooth down to this pump, which receives the instruction every five minutes to dose a precise amount of insulin. We'll actually have two of these pumps. One will have a reservoir filled with insulin and another with glucagon, so that the, that the, the phone can then instruct either the insulin or the glucagon pump to dose one or the other and either raise or lower blood sugar. So this is the closed loop system. Uh, as, it's, as we, we uh, envision it in the next, in the next trial. And so that allows us to have a fully wearable, fully mobile system. Well, what, do we do, what do we intend to do with that system? We have uh, plans to do a, a study where adults come to the MGH campus, and although they will have to stay here on the campus so we can keep an eye on them and make sure they're safe, they will have the full run of the campus, including the various restaurants and cafeterias on campus. They'll have access to the gym and there'll be no restrictions on their activity or the timing of uh, when they eat or what they eat. Then next summer we plan to do a trial with children in a diabetes camp environment. And my goal is by 2016 we'll have finished those trials and we can submit uh, the device 
uh, what's called a PMA, a pre-market approval application to the FDA, um, such that I'm hoping we can actually be you know, commercializing a device like this in, in five years' time. We envision that this system will be used as a first therapy for people who are diagnosed with type 1 diabetes in the future. Our goal is to develop and test a system that work equally well on children, pre-adolescent children, adolescent children, post-adolescent children, adults, adults with an intercurrent illness, and just by updating the weight, the system will be able to adapt online and handle all of those situations. And it's, a, it's an ambitious goal, I agree, but I think that's really what's necessary, and, and um, we think that we can do it.